see you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. A great week for the Flames, and they're riding a six-game win streak. As always, I'm Dan, and back with me this week, we've activated him back off the IR, is Matt. Matt, you're all healed up and ready to go? Yep. Your undisclosed upper body injuries cleared itself up? Yeah, dental surgery, always fun. There you go, and we got a little bit of cap relief putting you on the IR last week. Yep, so... As we move towards the trade deadline, I need that cap relief in case I decide to trade you to an, to some other podcast. Just don't send me to Edmonton, please. <laughs> I, th- I think that's on your one team no trade list. Yeah, pretty much. Well, Anybody you know, it, it would be funny just because of the fact that like I would have a hard time not making fun of them the entire time. There you go. All right, well, let's jump into this week for the Flames. The Flames played three games at the Dome. They're starting their month-long homestand. And uh, the first game after the All-Star break, the the six-day break, was on the 9th. And the Flames hosted the Vegas Golden Knights and got a big 6-0 win. Markstrom got his eighth shutout of the season, and Michael Backstrom had a goal and three assists. I'll give you my thoughts on this first, Matt, and then I'll, uh, I'll let you give me your thoughts. I thought that... This one, the Flames played really well in the first. I thought that they didn't have as great a second period, but they were able to weather the storm, which we haven't seen as much, and they fired back in the third to really take over and close this one out. Yeah, and the thing is is that uh, with how they started the game, they basically, Vegas was just dead on their feet for whatever reason. Uh, to start off with and which was very atypical of them and instead of letting uh, Vegas find their legs they just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing until they were able to get up 3 nothing, and then they j- you knew that Vegas was going to push back a little bit but Calgary just managed the ice time for the last 40 minutes and didn't really panic at any point and just coasted and went with the flow for the they were in control and they didn't need to exert themselves beyond a certain level and they just did what they needed to do I thought that this was almost the reverse of what we've seen for Calgary for so many years, where Calgary comes out not really playing their game, the other team gets up early, and then it just deflates the Flames. And while I thought that Vegas didn't get as deflated as Calgary did, I think Calgary got that three-goal lead, and it really just put them in control, and Vegas, I felt like, was chasing for most of the night. Yeah, and it's one of those things that separates this season's edition of the Flames versus previous years, where... After going up 3 nothing, this team a lot of times would have given up a goal or two to Vegas in the first 10 minutes of the second period, and then it would have been a race, basically, to make sure that they could hold on for the remainder of the game. And to their credit, they managed the storm and were calm and patient about it. 11 Calgary Flames had points in this game, and Backlund had a career-high four points. Talking to Backlund after the game, he told the media that he's been playing a lot more aggressively off the puck since that Chicago-Carolina road trip. Um, and I think we were able to see that. Like, this whole week, I think we're seeing a, a much more aggressive Michael Backlund. Well, and that's been a staple of both guys like him and Sean Monahan who both seem to struggle in the beginning part of the season and turn it on as things go along. And Backlund has been on fire, basically, uh, since he's been shooting more. And it's one of those things that when it's not working for you, uh, sometimes just getting back to basics of just firing the puck on net, you know that the goal is going to stop most of them. But every once in a while, you get that good bounce. And sometimes then, if one goes in, you get that confidence going. And then more and more good things start to happen. And then all of a sudden, you're on a roll. And then you have a four-point game and are just one of the best players in the league at the moment. And also a note on this one before I move on is this was the eighth shutout of the season for... Uh, Jacob Markstrom, which puts him two away from Mika Kiprasov's record of 10 in a season. 
Yeah, and the Flames as a whole have 10 and are now uh, only five back of the NHL record, modern day NHL record of 15. Well, let's move on to the next game, back-to-back games for the Flames, and you never know what to expect in a back-to-back game. That On uh, Thursday night, the Calgary Flames played the Toronto Maple Leafs, and for a back-to-back game, I thought the Flames were pretty strong again with a 5-2 to win over the Leafs. Uh, Marner ended an eight-game goal streak for Toronto, which gave uh, the Flames the big win here. Goals from Mangiapane, Hannafin, Shillington, Lindholm, and Anderson. What were your thoughts on this one, Matt? Well, at the start of the game, uh, frankly, it seemed a bit like a rope dope style of game where Calgary was keeping a lot of um, Toronto shots to the outside. There were not a ton of dangerous chances, but at one point it was like 30 to 14 for Toronto in the shot clock. And it's one of those where it it seemed like Toronto kind of punched themselves out and then um, they lost a little bit of focus and especially during the second part of the second period and then Calgary capitalized on that set play from Anderson to Hannafin and then Toronto just kind of imploded from there And before you knew it, it was 4-1, to and the game was over at that point. I didn't feel like the Flames played anywhere near a complete game here. They played well enough to win, but I think that Markstrom really covered up a lot of their flaws in this one. I agree. And it's one of those things that the Flames showed a lot of resiliency in that you knew Toronto was going to come in because they're a very good team. Uh, and they have a lot of offensive weapons to choose from and it uh it just one of those things and uh calgary was easily able to manage their game and not like especially like when they went up four to one like as soon as the it started in the third period they capitalized and scored another one right away where you know toronto could have had the some momentum if they had scored early and made the third a lot more competitive and instead they just shut the door and didn't have to really worry about it from that point on it's weird to say this i think because of the final score but there haven't been a lot of games the goalies won for the flames this year i feel like this is one of the few yeah the vladar when he played against toronto was another one yeah, I think that's fair. And the, maybe like two or three other than that. But yeah, it's been very rare that this team has relied on the goalie to get the two points. And then the playing their third game in four days, Saturday night, the Calgary Flames played the New York Islanders. Interesting note, this is the team that was in town ready to play the Flames as she sit in a hotel when the... Uh, 2019 season got shut down because of COVID and they were sent home. So we haven't seen them at the Dome in a couple of years. We opened their new building for them, um, but we haven't seen them here in a couple of years. And the exact same score as the game before that, a 5-2 Flames win against the Islanders. Um, interesting note here was um, the Oilers, and I, or sorry, the Islanders, and I've never seen this, um, switch goalies on the fly. They had... Um, their starting goaltender come out and um, Varlamov came out, took warm up, and then just before the game started, they put him on COVID protocol and Sorokin was put in net. So a weird last minute change there. Yeah, hopefully that doesn't cause too many of the Islanders players or any possible Calgary Flames players any issues. They've already had some outbreaks there. I know. It's just one of those things that, like, the last thing that this team or the Islanders need is more COVID. I was looking at who they have in their AHL team. Corey Schneider's down there, so maybe he'll get the call. The guy you never thought you'd see in the NHL again. Yeah. It's it's Um, tough. In in this game, I I guess, let me give you you some of my thoughts here. Good for uh, Adam Rzichka. This was his first multi-point game. He had um, a goal and assist in this one. He got the first goal, his third of the year, and then he also assisted on the Manjapani goal. Um, I thought in this one, the the Flames played 
their third game in four nights, and you could tell. They didn't look as sharp as usual. I thought that they were looking a little bit tired. They did a good job of keeping the Islanders out of the Ozone in the third, at least to last about five minutes. But this was not a sharp Flames game. And I think... And I think partially you have to give credit to the New York Islanders defensively because they were kind of in on the Flames all the time for the first, like, 40 minutes of this game. Uh, I would say that's true of both defenses. I mean, this was really a a tale of two defensive teams. Which makes sense because Calgary is one of the stingiest teams in the league and the Islanders are right behind them. I think we're second for goals against and they're fifth. So it's it makes sense that this game was that kind of a game. It's just yeah, there both teams were just good defensively and it took a while for the Flames relentlessness to finally take over. You know, and when you look at some of the games the Flames have played lately and the number of shots they've been getting, like they've been setting shot records lately, and to get 29, I think that that's really, like you said, a tale of the defensive play of both these teams. Yeah, and like, frankly, like the New York Islanders' uh, six defensemen easily rival any of the any other teams in the NHL, and like it, you can see where this team like how they got to the Eastern Conference Finals each of the last two years, it's just, boy, is there a forward group gone haywire. Like, I don't even know what happened to guys like Beauvillier and Barzal. Like, th- those are not the players that I recognize from last year, even. No, they're sure not. I think another thing that I noticed in this one was two goals of the Flames' five came from blue liners, and blue liners we wouldn't normally expect in good Branson and Tanev. You're getting some of your guys that are more defensively minded scoring, and I think this is the secondary scoring this team needs, right? When you're not playing your best games and your maybe top line is not um, putting the puck in, you got to be getting, uh, and even Sutter said recently, you got to get about 30 goals from your blue line a year. So it's good to see everybody chipping yeah, in and getting something. and there. it's interesting to see um, it, the defensive group as a whole seems to be noticing that the forwards on other teams are giving them a little bit more space it, it, from the blue line. And the Flames defensemen are like, okay, I will go and take that real estate. And that was especially the case in the good Branson goal. You know, it's like, okay, you're going to give me like right in the slot okay fine thanks bye <laughs> and you know it, it's just like the anderson to hannafin goal um in the toronto game where like the two defensemen were the guys down low and scoring that goal it, it you give them the real estate they're going to capitalize and i think that they're starting to notice that other teams are giving them that real estate because the forward groups are so dangerous for calgary that you know it's like ah well the defense can't score so we'll just let them do their thing and the the flames have made an adjustment a little bit and you know it's one of those things that um with the flames defense scoring so much lately that teams are going to have to recompensate and make sure that they're not giving that real estate which will create gaps for the forwards to do their thing so either which way it's it's good to see because of the fact that the Flames will have different ways of attacking the opposition instead of just relying on the forward group to get it done. How many times in the past have you and I talked about seeing the Flames defensemen sitting on the blue line, the ozone, and passing back and forth and back and forth and back, and then the puck gets stripped, and then everybody's got to come out. Like, we're not seeing that this year. No, uh, this whole team has more of a swagger of confidence uh, running throughout the lineup. And, um, like, with a few exceptions, like the uh, monahan dubay Richie line, that one particular line is, has not been fairly confident lately but uh at, for the rest of the group though like everybody just is like yeah i i fully am going out there expecting to score or get a damn good scoring chance out of it and they're making it happen instead of being tentative about it and just as a note on this one the man who had was said he couldn't score at home this year um adam or sorry andrew Mangiapani now has 
three goals or has scored in all three games at home, including a two goal game in the Vegas uh, game. So he's starting to pick it up at home. Oh, uh, you know, you got to get the bread at home too. So you can't just get it on the road. He's, he's a little late in the day to be baking bread. Yep. Well, with those three games this week, the Calgary Flames are now second in the Pacific Division at 58 points, right behind Vegas at 59, but we have three games in hand. So uh, one point down and three games in hand we're, behind we're us. We're going is, to pass Vegas. We are. Yeah, like uh, that's a f- yeah. pretty much a foregone conclusion, especially the opponents that the Flames play the rest of the month. We're going to pass Vegas. Right behind us is L.A. at 55 with 47 games played and Anaheim 49 uh, games played and 55 points. So, yeah, I mean, we're already number one if you look at it by win percentage. Yeah. So, But, yeah, I mean, with three games in hand and ours and Vegas' schedule, there's no doubt to me. It might not be a huge margin, but they will pass Vegas in the month of February. Oh, for sure. And now it's kind of imperative for this team not to get – a, any sort of ego about things like uh, they kind of went you know they were comfortably in first at the beginning of december and then the the wheels fell off the wagon it, you know and it's taken all the way to now to right the ship so it's it'll be interesting to see like when they do pass vegas now what and you know that'll be the story to look forward to in the coming weeks you know and it's interesting to me usually after this we'll call it the all-star break or the bye week in the past couple of years the calgary flames have really as you said the wheels have fallen off the wagon they're now on a six game winning streak and how often matt have we been at this point in the season going these guys have string six wins together just to get some points yeah because it's like uh, we're kind of screwed now and we need it now um, so I, yeah. so I think, you know, picking up these points now, March is going to be a tough month. Starting with the Vegas game, the Flames played 40 games in 80 days. They're going to be playing a lot of hockey. Yeah. And if they can pick these points up now, I think it's going to help them mitigate some losses in March. Yeah. Well, one good thing is that, uh, in the balance of February, the four, four of the six games remaining are against lesser opponents as well as Anaheim and Minnesota being the two good games. And then if you head all the way through March, like there's a game against Minnesota, a game against Tampa, a game against Washington, a couple against Colorado, three against Colorado, and a game right at the end of the month against L.A. All the rest of the games are against teams that are not in a playoff spot, and there are a lot of games next month. So the fact is is that like, not only are the Flames – playing a lot but they're playing a lot of very poor teams so that helps to mitigate like some of the pressure of playing like every other day because they can manage because of the fact that they're not playing the best every night i think that's a good point Another thing I think that's interesting if we look at even this week for the Flames is they're finding ways to win against different teams. They're finding ways to adjust their game against different teams. The Golden Knights, the Maple Leafs, and the Islanders all play very different types of games and have different types of rosters. And I wouldn't say in any of those three, even going back to the Dallas and uh, Arizona road trip, I wouldn't say that the Flames have come out and tried to play the same game in any of those five games this month. These these guys are able, and I think it goes to the confidence you were talking about earlier, they're able to tweak and sort of, you know, come out and adapt to their opponent. And you need to be able to do that if you're going to be a playoff team. If you want to go deep, you've got to be able to, to play against any team. Yeah, well, like, if you look at just from this week, like, you have a very balanced team in Vegas who are good at basically everything. Flames just completely ran over them. Toronto has a high-powered offense and is kind of mediocre defensively and goaltending-wise, and Calgary just waited for them to tire out and then capitalized on the weak defense. And the New York Islanders are an all-defense, no-offense team, and Calgary just kept applying pressure until eventually the Islanders broke. I would say that the Vegas game is probably the heaviest and the yeah. more, most checking forward team we've seen in a while, too. Yeah, and yet Calgary just 
walked all and over And how many them. times in the past have we played a, a heavy team and they've just started to check our players and we've, we've just broke down? Well, and that's where, like, one of the things that, like, a lot of people complained about when the Flames got guys like Goodbranson, like Richie, like Zadorov, is, oh, well, they're just okay players, but th- you're getting them because they're big. And it's like, yeah, that's the point. And it's games like this where stretches like this, where the other team has to worry, like especially with the Zadorov Good Branson pairing, of getting massacred, like Andre Casa was in the Toronto game. You know, because you have to keep your head up because those guys will hurt you if you don't. And you know, the Calgary has to play with that kind of we don't care about you know we will smash you if you you try <laughs> anything and you know the other teams have to play a little tentative and respect that which then gives everybody else the freedom to you know do their thing on the offensive side of things and it it's a good balance and that's why Calgary like it, especially when it comes time for the playoffs, it, it's going to be a t- very difficult team to beat, just because of the fact that you know it, there's no real exploitable weakness, uh, like especially on the blue line, because most of the players are either big or they play physically, except for Shillington, really. You know, and I don't want to get into the debate about who should be here, shouldn't be here, but when you look at some of those players you're mentioning, Lewis, Richie, some of these guys they brought in the offseason, Zadorov, Good Branson, it feels like the GM and his staff spent more time thinking about the type of player they want to bring in this year. If you look at last year, it's just sort of random whoever's name came up on the UFA sheet when we had, um, you know, just sort of random yeah, throwaway like Dominic NHLers. Simone, Josh Levo, like all of yeah, those like miscellaneous. It, yeah, it just felt like whoever was available they brought in. This year it felt like they knew what they needed and went out and targeted that type of player. Yeah, and frankly, like this team has lacked big defensemen uh, for eons. And, um, you know, it, it's like it, 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 you hearken back to like TJ Brody, for example. Perfectly good to a defenseman, but if you have a big forward, you know, he's going to win that battle against Brody. Now, if that same guy is going up against Tanev or Goodbranson or Zadorov, they're not going to beat those guys. And in order to be effective defensively, you need to have defensemen that can stop people. And the Flames now have basically three pairings worth of guys that can actually stop the opposition, which bodes well, (laughs) frankly. It does. And I think even on the front end, you know, we've sort of looked at Lucic to be that guy for a while. And whether you like him or not, Richie's shown he's valuable there. I'd even say Lewis has shown he's valuable there. Like we're starting to see, you know, more guys that can that can act as that muscle. Yeah. And even a guy like Adam Ruzitska, who is not the most physical of players, is also big. And, you know, him just being six foot four, two twenty five like that helps a lot you know and he does use his size at times to push defenders off the puck and that helps you know and it's like even like moving forward like having guys like Richie Lewis uh, Ruzitska um, Lucic on the depth part of the lineup that'll be good in the playoffs and you know, you have to expect that this team is going to try and add, especially with how they're running now, uh, to get line mates, frankly, for Sean Monahan's line. And, you know, you're, I would expect uh, a winger for each side of Monahan, frankly. Let, let's come back to that. I know, but you're not going to. Uh, lose guys like Richie out of the lineup though like even if you add guys to Monahan's line you're going to have you'll still the have size. the option to play yeah, those guys yeah exactly 
So on that idea of, you know, bringing guys in and the trade deadline, we're five weeks away from the trade deadline. I don't think it's time to get into a big discussion of, you know, who we think they should bring in yet. But um, just kind of looking at what this team needs in the secondary scoring, we've heard Brad Treliving say a number of times recently in various interviews that have been published online and that we've heard him talk about is that some of that secondary scoring needs to come from within, that it can't just be, you know, going out and buying it. Do you think, Matt, that with, and I'm not saying they shouldn't bring somebody in, but do you think that with Mangiapane and Backlund heating up over the last couple of days, that maybe it's mitigating the type of player they need? Maybe they can go for a little bit of a lesser guy or spend less assets knowing that some of our scorers are heating up? Frankly, like for the first handful of months of the season, like up until basically two and a half weeks ago, you had four guys that were scoring on a regular basis in the first line and Manjapane with occasional contributions from Monahan and Lucic, and then that was basically it. And now guys like Backlund and Coleman are showing up on the score sheet, which is vital. Uh, so that does help, but it's one of those things that, like, especially... Like, this team has the potential to be a cup contender uh, you know just with their makeup as a team and you know if it was you know if we were talking about any other team that had this makeup i'd be saying the same thing it's one of those where you you know you only have so many shots at a cup so stack that deck as much as you can and yes you know like having guys like backland and coleman scoring helps to mitigate things and you don't urgently need you know, replacements for guys like Richie or Dubé, you still could use a little bit more zest just so that way, like, every line is dangerous. And right now, like, Richie and Dubé have frankly been black holes of offensive <laughs> scoring chances. And it's one of those things that, like, it does need to be addressed. And... I feel like going into maybe this homestand, I was thinking the Flames needed to go out and get a bona fide second liner. And when I look at my my lineup for these guys of, you know, Goudreau, Lindholm, Kachuk is one. Mongepani, Backlund, Coleman looking like a better producing number two lately. I feel like now the need is for a, th- a strong three as opposed to kind of a weak two, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, like... W- Always in my mind, the types of guys that I would look at would be like your solid two-way guys for the third line or fourth line in terms of like they can play defense. Like they're not the equivalent of Josh Levo, who's like an all-offense and zero anything else kind of guy. You need Levo when he was here wasn't even all offense. No, but like that's why the Flames got him was because prior to that he was. And it's just one of those things that um, Calgary, you know, like we've mentioned, like a guy like Tyler Toffoli, uh, Gustav Nyquist, uh, JT Miller from Vancouver, even Connor Garland from Vancouver. Um, Like all of those guys, like, yes, they're good offensively, but they're also good defensively. And that's where, you know, like you don't want any of the guys that you would potentially acquire to be just like all offense, no defense guys. Like, say, like I a feel Phil like Kessel though, type guy. I feel like though, if Mangiapane and Coleman and even Backlund, let's say, weren't starting to produce, I could see the team going out and trying to get more of that pure offensive guy. And now I feel like there's more wiggle room in who you get. Yeah. And like well, you said, maybe bringing in more of a two way, knowing that some of that scoring seems to be covered. Yeah. And it also depends. You know, like if you can say, go get Joe Pavelski, say, and the price is reasonable, you just go do that. Right. Like, Every time we talk trading, you always mention that, that the price is right. We have to assume yeah. that if the price is right, I mean, if the price is right, they'd go get Connor McDavid, right? But yeah. I mean, the well, price and is. Th- that's the thing, though, is that. Um, with the calculus for this year because of the fact that like a lot of the things are kind of falling into place for this team to be like a legit cup team uh possibly i i would actually would rather see this team over spend a little bit and go that extra mile for say the pavelski if they can get him then 
managing like oh well we can go get say to Foley for a first and a B prospect or we can go get Pavelski for a first and a good prospect I'd rather them go with the Pavelski option than the Toffoli option. So let, I don't want to get into a lot of trade deadline stuff yet. We're still f- just over five weeks away, but just in a quick summary, if you think this team can go all the way this year, and I'm not opposed to that thinking, I think they definitely could. Would this be the year you think that it might make sense to have the first round pick and play at the deadline? I would actually be kind of annoyed if the flames have a first round pick this year. Uh, like uh, th- th- when you're saying if they have a first round pick, you mean come draft day if they're selecting in the first round? Yeah, like there is absolutely zero reason why that pick would should be here after the trade deadline. Like they need to use it. Uh, it, it th- they, this there are only so many times that you have an opportunity to win a cup, you have to go all in, and you know this is one of those times, frankly, uh, uh, in my opinion. Like this team has all of the you have a great coach all the parts that you need go for it you know and this only happens every once in a while so as of right now the flames have a first two seconds they have a second that they acquired in the sam bennett deal and their own second they do not have a third they do not have a fourth but they have a fifth and a seventh so they are without their third fourth and sixth this year and you know what not uncommon i mean if we look back at the deadline of previous years four teams that think that they're all in to put that first in play yeah and it's one of those things that like frankly there are only a handful of teams that are bona fide like top tier uh basically in my head it, it's basically florida tampa colorado and us as the four clearly better than everybody in their area teams and um like and the most likely to be a cup caliber team and carolina possibly but you know i don't like their offense quite as much as everybody else But, you know, like that, those teams, in my mind, should all be adding to go for a cup. Everybody else, eh, not so much. Well, let's talk about one uh, potential ad for this team. And uh, you know that I I don't like to talk about unfounded rumors, but uh, Elliot Friedman's been throwing this name around for a while, among other people, and that's Tyler Toffoli. We know the Flames have been in on him in the past. Uh, with Montreal, not an expiring free agent, though. Toffoli has a uh, contract through the end of 2023-2024 at 4.25 a year. If you're going to do this, this would have to be a hockey trade. And I guess, Matt, let's start with what do you think of the idea of Tyler Toffoli coming in as a flame? Perfectly viable. He played under what? Sutter uh, before. Um, uh, what do you think's a reasonable return to get him? Probably a, a first in Valimaki. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, I think at this point, and, and you and I have talked about Valimak in the past, I, you, I, I've said since, you know, we acquired him that this guy's been injury plagued and we haven't seen a full season out of him. I don't know that because of his injuries, he's going to turn out to be what we wanted. So I think if you can move him in a deal like that, sure. Well, it's also um, the unexpected development of all, Oliver Shillington. I and that definitely does. Yeah, you know, like if you look at the Flames defense core, like assuming that you keep Zadorov at beyond this season because he's a restricted free agent, you have uh, four of your six defensemen between Hannafin, Anderson, Shillington, and Zadorov under the age of 26. Yeah, Valimaki is a good player and he will probably be an NHL defenseman, but you don't necessarily need him especially with all of the other four playing well and even if they don't keep Zadorov I feel like you can replace that same type of role with a cheaper veteran guy on the open market yeah I agree and if you're just looking for a 5-6 I mean if we're looking for someone to replace good Branson there I think you could call up Mackie like there's a few other options there if you just want to fill a spot internally yeah exactly and um, it's one of those times that the Flames actually have a lot of depth, and why not use it? My thought when I was thinking of what they would give up, I was thinking the first and Dubé could be the thing. But the Flames, if they're going to bring him in, though, my worry on this is I don't think they want to acquire salary right now because 
I mean, they've got two big deals they have to figure out. I don't think they want to take on salary. So I'm thinking if they're going to do this, they're going to have ship salary out. And when I look at that, Sean Monaghan has been linked to Montreal for um, a while. The only thing with trading Sean Monaghan is that it hurts the team now. And I, I think that if you're going to trade Sean Monaghan, and I'm not opposed to that concept i think you have to wait until the draft or you know the off season at some point to do that just because of i don't disagree i think though it depends how much they think to foley is going to be a long-term piece and if they could still get that piece later on yeah well uh, in my mind like if you say we're to trade monahan for to foley in like, like those being mm -hmm. the principles in that deal you're still then going to have to backfill and go find a center then. And so you're kind of thinking you move um, Valamaki or Dubé, let's just say, yeah. out, bring to Foley, and then the draft you move the Monahan contract either through trade or buyout. Yeah. And it's one of those, like, it, it, frankly, like uh, all three of Backland, Monahan, and Lucic are viable players that can get moved in the offseason. To free up space for other things if need be and like frankly like i'm you know i don't want to see any of those three players move but for value for contract like all three are underwater a bit mm -hmm. and, and you know frankly not that much monahan's probably the most underwater he's playing more like a four and a half five million dollar player instead of a well, and, and if they want Monaghan to be a third-line center, that's kind of his role in this team. He's a very expensive third-line yeah. center. Mind you, I, I'd i rather pay for the third-line center than, you know, some other, you know. Yeah, but I think if you pay for that, then you've got to say goodbye to Goudreau, Kachuk, or Shillington because you're not going to be able to afford all of them. So I think there's a sacrifice to be made there. No, I know. And that's where, you know, you're going to have to shuffle some deck chairs later on. Mm -hmm. But, like, I'm... You know, it, to me, like, the most important thing is, like, going for it this season and then you're figuring things out a bit after. Like, how would you say there is enough uh, funds available that the Flames can um, adequately make things work, frankly, for this team moving forward? Like, it, it, you know, like, it, it, if you look at, like... Uh, even uh, losing Zadorov's money and replacing him with Connor Mackey, right? Uh, that saves you like three yeah, million dollars. Yeah, if you get rid of Zadorov's three point seven, you throw that into a Goudreau contract. You replace that with Mackey at league minimum. You're still saving some money there. Yeah, exactly. Like there's ways of getting the numbers to all work, so that way you can keep all the important players. It, it's just that you know that's kind of uh, like let's deal with that portion of life after <laughs> the, you're the thinking season. just you know do what you gotta do to get to the playoffs and figure out the rest later. yeah it, it's one of those that like yes you're mindful always of like implications like it, you know if say like the flames went out got uh connor garland or uh jt miller or both from vancouver like then that's you know changing the dynamic of the team a bit and which is not necessarily a bad thing it's just you know it's more heavily weighted i think than a guy like Toffoli. i don't disagree with that uh, that premise if you know what just make the deal if you can make the deal for um you know a, a reasonable piece in your first i like that idea of bring to in and figure it out later and i think that if the Flames are able to go deep, and we see this often, you might get, I mean, we've seen guys in the past that we go, they got that much for them, but when a guy gets that, you know, late playoff pedigree or even Stanley Cup pedigree, their open market cost goes up a little bit. Yeah. Well, also, um, like, you also have to look at the Flames um, moving forward beyond this season. Like, Peltier and Matthew Phillips both, frankly, should be in the NHL lineup next year in addition to Rajitska. So you have built in, you have like a full line worth of league minimum players. And that's not counting like say if uh, Connor Zari plays well or, you know, a handful of the other guys. So, 
you know, like there is going to be options for this team to have some of those good young players coming in that can help buoy some of the contracts as well. And I feel like if you're going to make the Tyler DeFoley deal, now's the time to do it. This is 29-year-old season. Last year, he had 44 points. Um, I feel like, you know, you don't want to be spending that kind of long-term money or those kind of assets on a guy who's 31, 32, 33. Like, if you're going to – that's a player that's been linked to the Flames for a while now, and I feel like if you want him, now's the time to pull the trigger. Yeah, and it, it's one of those things that because of the Flames not needing a defenseman or a goaltender at all – frankly and like we have plenty of replacements even internally that you can overspend a bit in terms of like assets in order to get the forward group that you need so that way you're both competitive now and later too and if they could do the first in Velimaki for Toffoli, I think that'd be a great return. I I think they might have to give up Dubé, but I think that then you're you're losing a piece of your line. I mean, if you've got Monahan Toffoli, who's on the left wing there? Well, like, I, I think... and I think that that's where like the seconds that we have and Dubé would be for another part. But you know, interesting. Okay, because I think that the Flames need to get two players not just one so see and, and i think you could get it i mean if you're gonna do to foley that's not a rental i think you'd no. go and you'd get to foley to be a part of your team and then i think you're not you're not wrong there i think you could then spend maybe the second to get a rental if you needed to just rent a piece for the year to fill that spot yeah and the, there's a whole litany of guys that are on expiring contracts that are good pieces for that line because you have to understand look at like with Monahan, like part of the problem that he's facing is that his line mates are not very good at finishing and like he he's he can only do so much himself and he's very much a good complimentary guy and you know and like that's why he worked so well with Gaudreau for all those years and it, you know, like it, there have been so many countless plays that have died on Dubé's stick or Richie's stick. And if he gets some quality line mates, then I think you'll see his five on five stats start going up because he's just as effective as he always was on the power play. It's just, you know, <laughs> the five on five part that he's been really lacking in. And I think that's mm -hmm. just due to you know playing with some poorer players which and even yeah. if the flames do nothing else i don't mind a third line of dubé monahan to foley i think you'll start yeah. to get more production out of that line as oh, well. oh for sure and like we even uh criticized um the flames at times in the past when it was gaudreau monahan and then insert miscellaneous mm -hmm. mediocre player here because like the other team's defense just has to go okay focus on Gaudreau and Monaghan who cares what the other guy's doing and you know and you can just key in on those guys and prevent them from doing their thing and where if you have three legit players on a line then it it's a proper balance and like that's why like the first two lines are working so well because each one of them can hit you good you know and I I should knock on wood when I say this. The Flames have yet to really have an injury this year. The Flames have yet to to lose man games. I think they have the most man game or the least man games lost in the whole league. Knock on wood. So even if you bring in a guy to Foley and we put him on, let's call it the third line, if something happens, you've then got a guy you can shuffle up the lineup. Right now, if we lose a top six guy, Dubé or Monaghan are your only option. Yeah, or let's call up Peltier and hope that he actually sticks right off the hop. And, you know, like, it, it, it's, like, how would you say, like, if the Flames go out and get to Foley or insert miscellaneous guy here, and there's injuries, you can put Peltier or Phillips in the lineup, but in the more sheltered third, fourth line roles where, like, they can have that space to exist without the pressure of like oh i need to be awesome right now yeah and i think then too you also don't need to call up the top guy i mean if you lose a guy and everybody moves up one you could call up phillips or Godan to fill a fourth line role and get adequate play for a week yeah exactly 
and not need to worry about you know or just have richardson play or you know <laughs> that's you know as good as our team's doing when you say the other option is richardson i mean that makes it sound like we should be much further down the standings than we than we yeah. are <laughs> Actually, you know, I mean, and I have no idea where he's at with his recovery, but at some point, Tyler Toffoli, who most people forgot is a flame, is also an option to go in there. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, I would pick Toffoli over Richardson. Yeah. I don't know where he's at with whatever injury he got. That was a waste of a pick so far. Uh, Third round to bring that guy in. Uh, no, that's Pitlick. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah, I remember they got rid of the third and the fourth in, like, the same week. Yeah, Zadorov was the third, and Pitlick was the fourth. And then, yeah, it was... Yeah, mind you, Pitlick has not been the same player that he was with Arizona. Like, he... No, he hasn't, but I think, you know, if I look at our lineup, I would rather put him in there than some of the players that are in the lineup. Yeah. I think when he's healthy, I would give him a shot over Lewis or Richie. Yeah, I agree. I don't think we need Pitlick to be, a you know, a top six guy but i think if he can get healthy and if he can look okay he's a serviceable you know better than richardson as your number 13 and maybe even a good you know fourth line yeah win. and it, it's frustrating when uh you acquire players and like you know like they have a pedigree of playing at a certain level and then they just ghost on you like it and it, it's frustrating because like pet like it, you know, like it has actually been a player that I've been hoping that the Flames would acquire for a while now. And, you know, it's because like he plays that game the right way. And yet this season, he's just been fighting it all year, which is frustrating. Well, we, we can't even say he's been fighting all year. He's played how many games? Of oh, I know. It, but like when he's been in the lineup, like he's not really been effective at all. I mean, if I take a look at him, he has played... Okay, more than I thought. 25 games of flame, two assists, two points. He's a minus five. So, yeah, I mean, maybe he's not where he wanted to be, but I think – and and obviously if he's this hurt, I'm thinking maybe there's something that was there prior to Christmas that he was fighting as well. Yeah, and that could very well be too. And you know what? Sometimes just having, you know, rising tides, um, you know, lift all boats. I think maybe just having the team being more loose – might make him play a little bit better as well yeah and it, he's always like basically throughout his career has been a the, a player that's basically been a 20 25 point kind of guy which is good for a third fourth line player it's just you know it happens it's just yeah sometimes you're just not a good fit or weird things happen and you know it's not like the last couple seasons haven't been weird <laughs> So just to uh, just to correct what you were saying earlier. So for this season, the third round pick was traded to Boston for uh, Vladar oh, and the yes. fourth was traded to the Kraken for Pitlick. Yeah. Then what did we send to Chicago for Zadorov? I think we sent them a pick in last year's draft. Uh, I don't know. I would have to check because we have all our picks next year and all our picks in 2024. I think we traded them a third last year, if I remember, but um, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, third yeah. round pick, so, yeah. Third round pick in the in last year's draft, which was kind of the crapshoot draft because nobody could, could um, you know, get any scouting done. Yep. And that's the third rounder the Flames got from Toronto in the Riddick deal. Yeah. That we sent. So while we're talking about the Flames, here's some unique um, Flames goalie stats to wrap up the week. Talking about the Flames, of the of all the shutouts in the league this year, Jacob Markstrom alone has 10.5 percent of all shutouts. Which that's I mean that's a lot for one goaltender. Um. So uh, who's gonna call the engraver and just start stenciling Jacob Markstrom's name on the Vesna Trophy? Well, I don't even, I don't know. We probably have to have some, you know, engraver that we keep in the Hall of Fame for two weeks to make sure he doesn't have COVID before he's allowed to touch anything. Just lock him in the vault for two weeks to make sure he's healthy. Yeah, I think, I mean, you're, you're right though, Matt. I think at this point, I can't think of a goaltender who, even if there's a team that does better in the playoffs, who you can say was more successful or team than Jacob Markstrom. I think the Vesna's got to be his. Yeah. And, you know, like especially, like, if he breaks Kipper's record for shutouts, which, frankly, he probably...
probably will just because he's only two away with half a season left um you know like that uh, Kipper won the Vesna that year so uh, like it it's rare for a goalie to hit 10 shutouts in a season and you know I think that uh if Markstrom does hit that mark then yeah uh, I I think that that weight alone would be enough to put him over others whose stats might be slightly better you know and i would have to look around at the uh at the rest of the league but i think he's got to be in line for the jennings trophy too yeah quite possibly awarded to the goaltender having played a minimum 25 games for the team with the fewest goals against i don't know if we are the fewest goals against but we got to be pretty close um yeah let me see uh yeah, the fewest and goals the, against uh, are us in Carolina. We have 108, they okay. have 109. Uh, but they played one more the than us. And there's also the Roger Crozier Saving Grace Award awarded the goaltenders played a minimum of 25 games and has the highest save percentage. So there's, I mean, there's a number of, of awards just for um, goaltenders, but I even think that depending on how this team goes, you could see him in line for the Hart Memorial Trophy too. Quite possibly. So this could be, you know, this could be the year that we really get that value on the Jacob Markstrom contract. Yep. And then the other interesting goalie stat is Dustin Wolf, who's looking exceptional down in Stockton this year. If you get a chance, the AHL plays their games for free sometimes on uh, AHL TV. Take a watch. They're a really good team to watch. He's now set the record for most wins in a season by a goaltender for the Heat. And it's only February. He's got 20 wins already. Yeah. He's kind of doing okay. Uh, You know, uh, Stockton is one of the top two teams in all of the AHL. And, yeah, uh, they're just massacring everybody. And Wolf is a big part of that. You know, and I think, and you can tell me what you think about this too. I think it's good the Flames went out and got Vladar because I think it's going to mean that they're not as eager to rush Wolf to the NHL. Like, I think... I, I like goalies who are young to get playtime. I don't think they learn as much sitting on the bench. And I think if they didn't have that backup, if they had a one-year veteran guy, I think they'd be more likely to rush Wolf to the NHL. Maybe disagree with my thought, but I think he, the best thing for him right now is keep him in the A and let him see playtime and let him see pucks. Well, like frankly, like with Markstrom's contract and the length of it, he, you're going to expect him to be an elite goaltender probably for the next two or three seasons beyond this one. And it, if you're it, uh, like, I, I would expect Wolf to play at least another year or two in Stockton. And then, you know, depending on like if Wolf plays as good and repeats next year, then I think that you might start exploring trade options for Markstrom possibly see and i don't even know if i'd go that but, way i mean you've got marshall until 25 26 and vladar till the end of next year i think after vladar's done at the end of next year you bring up wolf well, and you uh, sort of yeah. transition him with markstrom as his backup and that that's where uh or not as backup but let's say a 1a 1b type scenario in a couple of years yeah it, it's one of those things that it, it you know because vladar's played well too it, it's kind of uh Calgary I might just, think just end this up team... be, being in a weird spot like uh, a few teams have where like they have an awesome goaltender, another awesome goaltender, another awesome goaltender, and another awesome goaltender because Arseniy Sergeyev in the USHL is also kicking some butt down there. Um, so like another Flames goalie prospect. Yeah. So, you know, it's one of those things that Calgary might just be on a, a particular – stretch where they like all, all the goalies are good because uh. nobody's worked out since i mean <laughs> kipper we've had all these guys we thought were gonna work out and none of them have well e- even going back like the last goalie that we drafted that actually worked out was mike vernon so <laughs> you know it's been a yeah minute. i mean you don't have to draft him though we didn't draft markstrom no right? but y- we didn't draft ladar no but y- you know what i mean like it, it's been a minute since the flames have had yeah quality goaltending and so yeah, we've had some, like, we thought, we all thought Parsons would do well with how I was drafted. That hasn't worked out. But I think that, you know, if we look at, if we look at Vladar being done a league minimum contract in 2022, 2023, and then being an RFA, you'll be able to qualify him for cheap, even if you want to keep him around for another year. 
I think you could. But I think by 2024, which is you know the second last year of Markstrom's deal, you could get a good deal if you wanted to move him. But I think that's where you start to bring Wolf up to be that backup. And as Markstrom's getting older, I think Wolf's may be a starter that's playing 30 games that year or starting 30 games that year, I should say, behind Markstrom as you try to transition Wolf to being your eventual starter. Yeah, and it's one of those things that oh gee we have too many and we've good seen goalies. a lot of times when a goalie's looked really good at the ahl level but didn't quite translate right away to the nhl and that's why i don't want to oh, necessarily yeah, no. jettison markstrom and say he's the guy no, until he's got a couple seasons yeah under. and like that's part of where like the question mark for the whole situation is really what happens with vladar and how he turns out because you know he has all the potential and ability to be a top starter in his own right and it's like okay well what happens if that happens <laughs> you know because that could you know and either and either way then i mean whether him or markstrom you could have a good asset oh exactly it's like oh gee, whether which, we keep him or whether we deal him. it's like oh which awesome goaltender do we keep you know it's like oh gee the problems in life <laughs> Well, speaking of problems in life, as we wrap up the show this week, uh, moving on from the Flames and moving up the QE2, it looks like our friends, the Edmonton Oilers, have some problems as they've fired yet another head coach. I've lost track of who else coached there. And now Jay Woodcroft, who is their AHL coach, is the next guy up. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those things that, you know, that having two quality NHL players out of 20, it, you know, for some reason doesn't work at the NHL level. Um, and yeah, it's one of those things that like Tippett, it, despite the Oilers lack of overall success has been the second best coach in their entire franchise's history. And it's like, you know, like at some point, you know, like Tippett has a track record of being a very good coach and he was getting as good of results frankly as you can out of the Oilers lineup and you know like it's one of those things that this is entirely a management and ownership problem with not have hiring the right people uh, that can identify like how to build an actual NHL team like if you but I, I don't even think it's a coaching problem there like I think it's and I think no. Holland's the best GM they've had, but the coach, as as Sutter tells us all the time here, he only coaches the players that put on the ice. I just think that the Oilers don't want to don't want to admit that they're not good and they need to blow it up. And the coach is the easy scapegoat. Yeah, and like uh, frankly, like if you remove Drysaitel and McDavid, and like say the two best players from any of the other bad teams, the Oilers are the worst team in the league. It, it, and by a mile it's just that they have the two best players in the nhl and that's propped them up because they are that good but you know there's only so much lipstick you can put on you know that and you know like the oilers are not a playoff team and it, you know like any team that has even a semi-adequate group of players is going to be better and we're seeing that with both LA and Anaheim and even San Jose like they're you know they actually have depth of actual NHL talent and that supersedes two players no matter how good they are since 2012 the last 10 years the Oilers have gone through eight coaches Tom Rennie Ralph Kruger Dallas Eakins who has now has a job in Anaheim uh Todd Nelson Todd McClellan, who now has a job. Um, he's the head coach of L.A. It's interesting you mentioned L.A. and Anaheim. Two teams that are now coached by former Oilers coaches. Ken Hitchcock, Dave Tippett, and now Jay Woodcroft. Yeah, and... It, and Tippett will land on his oh feet. Oh, yeah. Well, Tippett's a, a good coach. Like, he's one of the top ten in the NHL. It's just... There is only so much you can do with that team. Like, the goaltending is embarrassingly bad. The defense... It, is marginal at best and they have two forwards like there's a reason why Tippett was playing McDavid and Drysaddle 30 minutes a night uh, to the point of exhaustion because like there's literally nothing else and you know like 
well you're even seeing like them him doing that for a couple of years like mcdavid and dry settle are horrendously bad five on five and like if it wasn't for the power play the oilers would probably be down with montreal right now and it's actually getting to the point of being a shame frankly that they're that in getting to well it it it's funny as a flames fan but you know like you're you literally have the two best players in the league and like there is absolutely no reason why that that team should be that pathetic and you know i think the thing with that team too and, and it's i mean how often do you see a team that's not doing well try to move their star players at least with uh, mcdavid there's no way you're gonna find a buyer for that kind of contract well the thing is that well you could you'd probably have to eat part of it or like eat, eat a bad contract just to, so the other team could actually afford to have him on the team but like as strange as it sounds like i think that the thing that actually would be in the oilers best interest would be to say hey both those guys are on the block give us your best offer and if some absurd like uh Eric Lindros to Philadelphia type offer comes available for either or both of those guys like just to replenish you know like just how bad the rest of the organization is you know I, I think that that might be in their best interest even though well, you know the absurdity of trading the two best players in the NHL just because like there is no real easy way to fix that and you know like it's gonna take years frankly to rebuild the oilers into a competent franchise and you know well let's let somebody else deal with the oilers oh, yeah. and their competency oh no it, it as a flames fan it's absolutely hilarious that they're you know it's just it, it's a shame for the nhl because you know like after crosby and Ovechkin, like McDavid, really was like the next marketable superstar, and you know, like in order for them to market that guy, he actually needs to be in the playoffs and you know pushing for a cup instead of you know possibly getting to the playoffs and then getting blown out in the first round by any team, even if it's Chicago. <laughs> you know, like it, it's. It, it's just not good for the NHL. I, I think the big question there is when Daryl Cates says he's had enough. Yeah. And, like, that's where I think a lot of the problem is, is that the ownership just is not willing to do the right things with that organization and hiring people that, frankly, shouldn't be uh, involved. I don't know. I thought they, I thought they had the right, uh, coach and Tippett. I thought they oh, yeah. had the right GM and Holland, like finally some competent people. But I just think that, and, and again, I don't want to get too much into Oilers talk, but I worry that I think that Daryl Cates is got his hand too far in the pie there. And that the, the GM can't do their job without having interference. Yeah. Uh, there, there's something wrong, frankly, like it, it's beyond, you know like it, it's visibly there's something wrong well going back to the flames where there isn't anything wrong right now they're riding a six game win streak into another three game um homestand this week finishing off their well not even finishing the middle of their month of home games three games this week three three games not in four this time which is nice they play uh tuesday wednesday and then they get two days off thursday friday and they'll play against saturday so on the 15th, the Columbus Blue Jackets come here to the Saddle Dome, 7 p.m. start. The 16th, the Anaheim Ducks come, 7.30 start. The 19th is Seattle, the first time the Kraken will be in the Saddle Dome, an 8 p.m. start. Matt, I won't uh, I won't put, put Kevin's picks from you on, or Kevin's picks last week on you for this week, but uh, I didn't do well. I thought we would lose to Vegas and win the other two last week. What do you think for this week? Uh, by the way, what uh, did Kevin predict? Uh, I think Ke I, I have some notes here that um, Kevin, I think Kevin picked all three. Uh, so Kevin would have picked correctly, but you're already up on me for the first time ever. You've got three wins and I have zero so far. Yeah. Um, hmm. I, I'm actually going to go three zero again this week. 
You think so? Yeah, I think that a nine game win streak. Um, actually, you know, to be honest, I think that this win streak might hit double digits, but you know, that is getting ahead of myself a bit. So that would be the entire homestand up until the Vancouver road trip. Interesting. Yep. I wonder what the longest win streak in the league is. Double digits would have to be getting close. Yeah. So you're thinking they're going to beat Columbus, they're going to beat Anaheim, they're going to beat Seattle. Yeah. Uh, it, Do you think that we see Dan Vladar in any of those games? Possibly the Seattle game. Because uh, there's been enough time off uh, for the Col- Columbus game that, uh, you know, Markstrom should be able to go because, you know, a couple days off. Uh, By the same logic, though, I mean, there's two days off before the Seattle game. So if you played Markstrom, Columbus, yeah, I guess you could play him back to back in those. I think it, I think you'll see Vladar in either Columbus or Anaheim. Yeah, it. I think it depends on the style of the Columbus game. Like I, I would assume Markstrom goes in that one. Um, it, he might not. It, Columbus would. It, it's either going to be Columbus or Seattle if, for Vladar. Oh. Because the Flames might just decide to stick him in against Columbus a- ahead of, because again, Eastern Conference team, it doesn't really matter if you lose that one. We often hear that the coaching staff makes those decisions before the season starts, and I could see them a pencil. Well, I guess we didn't have this schedule, yeah. So never mind. But I was gonna say I could see you penciling that in there as, yeah, this week let's put him in there. But even when this schedule came out. I can still see you penciling them in against Columbus for the same reason. I think Columbus the weakest of the teams. In I mean, they're a strong team in the East, but they're the weakest in that if you give up the points, it doesn't matter. And I don't think they're the they're the most complete team of these three. No, oh, and I think Seattle could surprise. Yeah. Um, especially with G- especially with Giordano coming back to the dome. Yeah, it, it's one of those things that uh, to me, like the single most important game is the Anaheim game. Um. I think that the, like the Flames probably win with Vladar against Columbus or Seattle anyway, mm-hmm. so I think there's a little less pressure to put Markstrom in in either of those games. Yeah, I think it just depends on you know because of the fact that Markstrom's played so well this past week <laughs> that I think that you might just Sutter might just be wanting to ride the momentum a bit. So we haven't seen Vladar. In, I mean, we've we've seen him very sparingly lately, and I think you've got to make sure he's ready to go as well. So I I would I'd be putting him in there just to keep him going. Yeah, it's one of those that there's really it's part of having so many good goaltenders is that you know it, there's less pressure. <laughs> well, and for the first time in as long as I can remember, the Flames look confident in front of both goalies. Yeah. It be, and especially because they're both playing so well that you don't have to yeah. worry about like oh geez Vladar's in that you know uh, like ooh. when I look at this month I think I would put Vladar in in Columbus and then again on the road in Vancouver yeah I could see that and I think you've got to get him going because next month you've got a lot of back to backs you've got three back to backs next month so I think you've got to use this month to get him going and get them ready for that schedule. Actually, you got four back-to-backs next month. Yeah. Yeah. It, it'll be like, interesting. I would hate, I, I'd hate to throw him in in a back-to-back when he hasn't started in a month. Yeah, like especially like the Oilers and the Capitals next month uh, on a back-to-back. and then Yeah, Oilers, Capitals, Detroit, Colorado, Buffalo, Vancouver, Arizona, Edmonton. Like there's, there's a, a lot of back-to-backs there where he's going to have to play one of them. Yeah. And I think you've got to keep him warm, especially as a young guy. I think you've got to – he's not like a veteran goalie. Often we see veteran goalies able to sit longer and still look good. Yeah. I think as a young goalie, you got to keep him going. Yeah, I agree. And I think with a six-game win streak, you have that luxury of putting him in there. It's not like we've got to win to get, you know, into the final wild card spot. True. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh... Roll the dice. And... But yeah, I think Colum- I think Columbus or Seattle is the way to go. He also hasn't started at home yet, so I can see them wanting to put him in this month to get him his home start. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see, and especially with so many games in the next couple of months, uh, how they'll exactly manage. Because basically, like, what I'm kind of expecting is any Eastern Conference team, pretty much, you'll see uh, Vladar in. <laughs> 
I like I don't you know as long as they keep up their good play yes but I can see this team going on a bit of a dip again in March and then having to make up some ground yeah quite possible but if we look at Eastern Conference teams then in uh, in March you've got Montreal Washington on a back to back Detroit first game of a back to back New Jersey Buffalo first game of a back to back and a Tampa game too yeah, that's true. I don't know if I'd put him in against Tampa, though. No. That's why I didn't. Especially if he plays the back-to-back with Washington, you're not going to put him in again two days later. No. I think the Tampa game is a measuring stick game where you've got to play your starter. Yeah, I think that like in that week, you'd put uh, Vladar in against Washington and Detroit because uh, there's back-to-backs and then have Markstrom play, play, play Edmonton, Tampa, and Colorado. Yeah, and we see Edmonton twice next month, both at home, so I can see giving them a different look. Depend on where it is. We see Edmonton right after the deadline as well. Yeah, Lots of different permutations. Well, may- maybe the time to make the Toffoli deals uh, right around the 3rd of March when they're here and he can just scoot his bag across the hall. Yeah. Then. Make life easy for him. That's right. Why travel across this country and, you know, just wait till wait for two weeks, get a little bit more cap relief, and then bring him in and we can just have bags scooted back and forth. Yeah, well, it, you know, it could be like uh, when... Uh, LA left Conroy and Red Deer that one time. Yeah. Yeah, could be. In in that case I think Montreal left to leave him in Edmonton or something. But. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I actually I was I was joking up in the press box after the New York Islanders game when Varlamov got got uh, put on COVID protocol and I said, Well he might not be able to leave the country now. You know what the good solution is? Just trade him to Edmonton. Then he can just stay here and travel up the QE two and still be quarantined. Yep. Cause they're looking for a goalie. All right, Matt. Well, I think that does it for us. If anybody else wants to chime in on their thoughts on what it might take to get Tyler to Foley or what you think the Flames might need to do in order to shore up their forward depth, or if you want to tell us how long you think this win streak is going to go, we'd love to hear from you. You can uh, let us know on Twitter. We're at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. You can leave a comment on our website at firesidechat.ca. You can leave either a comment on the show. You can contact us through the Contact Us page, or there's a way to leave us an audio message from there as well. And we will be back next week to hopefully talk about a nine-game win streak for the Calgary Flames. Yeah, then as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.